You can support the Double Loop Podcast by contributing at patreon.com slash double loop podcast. Thank you to our supporters, and we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Double Loop Podcast, your source for everything about fingerprints. While you're working on your comparisons, we'll talk about comparisons. I'm Eric Ray. And I'm Glenn Langenberg. All right, Glenn, how you been? Pretty good, sir. Are you? Good. I think we're both getting ready to head out of town tomorrow. Yeah, true. Uh, I am going to Detroit, and uh, we actually did get a bunch of people from out of town, yeah, and out of country, which nice. that's going to be fun. <laughs> just just from across the border in Canada, eh, or from further uh, afield? Some from Canada, but I think we also have from some from, like, the uh, Caribbean, even. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, We'll be we'll be going through Detroit. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm I'm heading uh, a bit further north up to Anchorage. So wow, is that? Yeah, I'm definitely looking to um, to see the sights and and uh, take in some of the amazing views that Alaska has to offer. Yeah, my, my first trip up there. Um, my dad's got plenty of stories of uh, uh, from when, when he was in the Air Force uh, of having different missions have. Uh, basically layovers in alaska but um it'll be uh the first time for me so definitely excited about that yeah that's that sounds really cool and take some pictures and yeah share your share some stories yeah that's the plan go wrestle kodiak <laughs> i i'm gonna i'm gonna try to avoid the wildlife yep indeed wow that that is that sounds pretty cool and and again how amazing is that you get to go you know up there to teach fingerprints yeah I, I was i was showing my wife a map of everywhere i've been because of fingerprints and uh i i feel really fortunate that that yeah. uh that this you know this kind of goof that landed me in this field has taken me to so many different places so uh between conferences and teaching uh it, yeah i've definitely seen places and met people i definitely would not have been able to do otherwise and uh and, you know, just kind of smile at that. It, I'm really fortunate. Yeah, yeah I, I hear you, man. So uh, what's been, uh, uh, what do you want to talk about? We have a, a guest here we're going to uh, interview for most of the show, but um, uh, you said you wanted to talk about something else here real quick first. Right, wanted to clear the air on something. Uh, so in the last episode or previous episode, uh, we had talked about... Uh, this issue going on in Illinois, there was oh, just yeah. to quickly quickly recap um, as we've discussed in other episodes. Chicago PD had some has had some issues with their local defense attorneys. Uh, they were attending pretrial interviews. They really weren't answering questions if they were outside of anything about the case. Uh, they weren't going to answer any scientific foundation questions about research error rates, validation studies any anything about the process or the foundation of the, the science they they would quit the interview and walk out if uh, the questions continued and so i was at a recent conference and the head public defender brendan max was sharing a letter from illinois state police that essentially was saying the same thing this it was from the director and uh it was basically saying that uh, pretrial interviews will be limited only to case questions or what happened in the case and not you know, foundational reliability issues yeah. etc and uh you know you and i were both surprised by that because we've known isp examiners for you know many, we've known many of them over many years yeah and it, it was very surprising that this laboratory would take this position or at least this director and i think my comments were aimed towards that director specifically right, because know, i know those examiners can handle those kinds of questions yeah, and you know, they, they Illinois, do uh their state lab has a long history of of being a leader yeah i mean they were i believe the first crime lab in the country to be accredited um back in and, the and, and their their big trainer guy david grieve was yeah. out of their jfi oh and, absolutely uh, you know, a famous international instructor i think that was the the the, the big surprise i mean i was when you told me about that, I was floored. I had, because, yeah, I've met, you know, a good number of those guys at a conference a few years ago. Um, we interviewed them on podcast. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they... We, we, we were surprised. But, again, yeah. I think our comments were directed towards the director 
yes. himself. And in fact, my my anger that would come from such an issue is when cops tend to play lab directors and <laughs> get involved in scientific issues where maybe you know um, maybe it's not the best mix of things. That said, um, so I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this. One of the ISP examiners reached out to me and said, mm, you know, every story has two sides and maybe you should hear our side of the story. And I said, yeah, please, I'd, I'd like to and we'd be happy to discuss it if there is an, another side to it. And so, again, this is their version of this and it sort of makes sense. So I and and one thing to clarify that the letter and the comments made at the conference by the head public defender had a lot to do with the DNA section issues that they were having with with the, D, the DNA section when they were doing their pretrial interviews. In fact, this head public defender had nothing but nice things to say about the, the latent print examiners, their policies, procedures, etc. So anyway. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened with the DNA examiners. I don't know what the difference between that would be there. But uh, this latent print examiner reached out to me and said, well, look, we, we never denied them. They were coming into the lab. And what was happening was that the public defenders were coming in and they were demanding these three, four, five, six hour pretrial interview sessions. And it just became the same thing over and over and over. They'd come in, they'd ask for a copy of everything. And we would tell them in advance, you know, please let us know, you know, what kind of articles you'd like to discuss so we can prepare. And we haven't memorized this stuff. We're examiners and we're not right. researchers. So give us a list, and the list would be 20 to 30 different research papers that they're supposed to have read and be knowledgeable about. And they were getting very frustrated by this. And apparently the same thing was going on in DNA, but maybe to a different extent. And so I, I think they just had reached a, a boiling point, and the director at this time, and again, maybe not so well advised, had just said, all right, enough of that. We're not doing these anymore. But I think ultimately... Although that letter might have been issued, you know, we're not going to do these. In practice, they actually are still doing these. At least the latent print section is still doing these pretrial interviews. However, they have some restrictions on it. And the restrictions are that uh, they're limiting it to two hours. And if That's they need fair. more time than that, they have to have a, a you know, different, different date, different time. And they first need to discuss all the case details, anything related to the case discussed first, then any time left over in those two hours can be dedicated to all these other ancillary issues. And, and this was taking away some of the carte blanche of you can interview any examiner as long as you want and um, <laughs> as opposed to – and I, I think the sense was – it felt like they were just on a fishing expedition to find maybe the weak examiner in the pack, the one who maybe couldn't articulate everything the best. And it had nothing to do necessarily with their level of documentation or their policies. It was more about – it felt like defense was trying to figure out who's a good expert and who's maybe not so articulate and then maybe focus a little bit on the weak link. And that's not yeah. always a great representation of the whole system. So that's their version of it and why they put some restrictions in place. I don't know that they're entirely happy about the letter itself since the letter does exist and it says what it does. And, it, and again, it might not have been reflective of them. It may have been, as I had said in the other episode, there, I think it had something to do more with DNA and maybe more reflective of some of those challenges. But regardless, it, it didn't matter because my point being this letter is out there and the head public defender is making a lot of hay with it. And again, it just it fit right in with what Chicago PD was doing. And right. the, the difference being is that ISP examiners can answer those questions. They can. <laughs> right. Chicago PD examiners did not seem able to answer those questions. Got it. So it's... Yeah, I mean, and I fully understand the the, uh, the limitations of it, um, which is two hours as a limit. I, I I can't think of any case where I was in for you know two hours straight. You know, the the one that we've talked about quite a bit on, you know, inconclus inconclusive with similarities. You know, I think over time ended up being you know well, two or so, two or three hours of interviews with prosecutor and defense kind of combined. Uh, but yeah, if there 
want to do, <laughs> trying to do like four or five hour stretches, uh, I can see that being, you know, a bit excessive. Yeah, I mean, especially since there's pressure on them to get, you know, their cases out and their, right. you know, their production laboratory. So I'm, if if this if that is the case and that there was a, more of abuse of, you know, uh, just a, a, abusing their their goodwill a bit and uh, taking things a little too far. Right. Yeah, I, I can see where they're coming from. I could see why also, um, you know, they they would certainly want their side of the story. But it, it seems like a nice, you know, it seems like the perfect recipe, bad recipe for, uh, you know, one side abusing it a little bit, the other side, um, uh, you know, having this, this letter that's out there. Again, it wasn't something that they wrote. This was coming from their command staff, which... Is paramilitary in this organization and maybe doesn't represent right. you know all the bench level scientists civilians so i can see why this would have caused a bit of consternation and as well since we were talking about it and why they would want their side of the story out there right it, it's it, it makes a little bit more sense now but the letter still doesn't quite pass the the old five o'clock news test you know it well yeah it, it doesn't sound good well, yeah, and especially if their side of the story is not being heard, their background to it, then it, it in a vacuum, absolutely, it, yeah. it just it's it sounds like you know a paramilitary forensic organization uh, trying to avoid being transparent, and I, I don't think that's the case at all. But that's the perception, unfortunately. Right, right. Well, um, let's switch over to. Um continuing on our discussion from the last uh, episode where you and I uh, and our somewhat limited knowledge on uh, accreditation uh, with this new ANAB thing coming through uh, and actually talk to an expert on this. Um, And uh, so we'll kind of cut now and switch over to uh, our interview with Anya. All right, so I'd like to welcome our guest today. Uh, we're very pleased to have an expert in uh, accreditation. Uh, in the last episode, Eric, uh, you and I both admitted we are not experts in this. This is not really our domain, but we were uh, just plowing through some of the potential changes that were coming uh, with the change from uh, ASCLAD Lab being merged with ANAB, and we discussed this all in the last episode. And one of the things that, Eric, as you know, we were trying to figure out what sort of changes will be impacting fingerprint examiners, whether it's documentation, reporting, or um, you know, some of the other procedural things that we might have to consider. And so today we have an expert with us, and we're pleased to welcome Anya Einseln, Anya. Uh, Anya is from, uh, well, Anya originally worked at ASCLAD Lab, I believe, and then when uh, they merged into ANAB, joined ANAB, but then has since retired, sort of, but then is still working for ANAB and doing instructing. And she is uh, instructing the uh, assessor courses. So, Anya, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, we are really looking forward to having an expert today to bounce some some questions off. You don't know this, Anya, but I took my assessor class with you. You were actually my uh, my instructor when I went through uh, assessor training back when we went to the ISO. Well, I hope you forgive me for all the silly jokes that I told in class. <laughs> oh, th- I, I, I will say that... Um, I, I, I was very trepidatious to take the course. I really was not looking forward to it. And then uh, about 10 minutes in, I went, oh, this is the perfect person teaching this class. Uh, you, you, you love quality assurance, and you are good at it, and you are passionate about it, and it shows in your teaching. Thank you. Uh, actually, if, if we don't mind getting in a little bit into your background, how did you get into quality assurance, and how did you join ASCLAD Lab and do the teaching? Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to share that background information. So uh, having worked for 10 years with, with ASCLAD Lab, now known as ANAB, uh, prior to that, I actually worked at the FBI laboratory. So I worked both in Washington, D.C., as well as their new facility in Quantico, Virginia. But actually, my quality assurance backgrounds uh, began even before then. I ran a destructive testing laboratory in I love a, the name of that. <laughs> in, in a 
large corporation that manufactured items, so I had the opportunity to use a little bit of my engineering background, a little bit of my chemistry background, a lot of my scientific background um, to run that testing laboratory. And the corporation itself was pursuing the Malcolm Baldrich Award and the kind of back way that I came into forensic science uh, with that scientific experience, the back way I came in, was uh, they were moving my position from just south of Baltimore, Maryland, to the beautiful countryside of Pennsylvania, which was unfortunately in the middle of nowhere. And I really didn't (laughs) have an interest as a young 20-something to be moving out to join lots of cows and pigs, which are wonderful, wonderful animals, but not really something you want to do when you're in, in your 20s. So I actually... At that point, decided that it was my time to uh, provide some public service. So I looked at a lot of the different federal agencies and state agencies in the Washington, D.C. area. And the FBI laboratory just happened to have an opening at that point for a chemist because they hadn't actually created the position of quality assurance specialist at that time. So sure. so they were hiring folks with strong scientific backgrounds and asking them to help coach the laboratory through the process of developing a quality system and getting that laboratory accredited for the first time, which it did um, two years after I was hired. So they were, they were able to achieve their now what we call ASCLAD Lab legacy accreditation in 1998. So that was one of my big, big projects for the first two years of my career with the FBI. And, and was this something that wow. you, you thought, oh, I, I really do enjoy quality assurance, that this is something that I, I'm, I'm passionate about and, and, and could do as a career? Absolutely. This this is something I definitely enjoyed. I realized um, you needed to have a certain temperament, a certain ability yes. to get along <laughs> with folks, a certain ability to, to push back at times and basically say, okay, I understand your fear. I understand, but you can't tell them the word fear because a lot of people get upset when they say, oh, well, you're just fearful of that. So it's, it's kind of taking that step back saying, yeah, this is going to be a little uncomfortable, but let's talk about why you're uncomfortable about this and let's compare compare the forensic community to the worldwide community and see all the transitions they've been going through and then recognizing that it was equally important for the forensic science community to also begin that journey and and embrace that process. Yeah, that's that's uh that's really fantastic and and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you were generally no one is ever happy to get a phone call from you. I, I, I assume when you're the quality manager, yeah. uh, they're generally not looking forward to a meeting <laughs> with you. Um, and so you're typically seeing people on their not so great days, but you have to make it a positive thing that it's not about, it's not punitive. Uh, it's about improvement. It's a process, not a penalty. And all those sorts of things that you have to deal with. You know, I mean, you're a little bit of. A referee in the sense that you are, you know, have these rules, but at the same time, you're also having to coach them a little bit or um, deal with, like you said, personality. I mean, um, a little bit of a counselor in some ways. Most definitely. And and just helping them feel a little bit more comfortable. And many times it's just giving them that additional piece of information they needed to put part A and now connect it to part B. So yeah, that's that's a big part of the conversations. And just sometimes also, uh, for for your listeners who may have young children, sometimes you just let need to let people kind of thrash around with it for a while and be upset and, and, you know, throw their papers down on the table and go from there. And, and then once they realize, okay, yeah, all right, let's let's go ahead and have the serious conversation and, and just let them um, I jokingly call it go through the seven stages of grief. Yes, we need to go through the process of recognizing, yeah, things aren't how we've always done them. Things are changing. Um, and in the latent print community, I think the the case in Pennsylvania was one of the larger drivers that helped the latent community in general be aware of how these changes are now going to impact them, where um, Daubert... It was it was U.S. V. Mitchell. Thank you. Mitchell. Yes. So the the that Daubert case was one of the bigger stepping stones that that folks had to forgive me stumble over um, and then be ready to to kind of accept and and seriously have that conversation about accreditation and quality assurance. Yeah, I, I think that was actually kind of a, a blessing in disguise in that it really did push the latent print discipline 
forward into that change of the new century a lot quicker than a lot of other disciplines being you know pretty high profile and getting so many people across the country involved but let me jump right to one of the questions that a lot of latent print people across the country are going to be most concerned about and um, that is the annotation of images when they you know, reach well any conclusion but specifically the identification conclusion obviously you know, a lot of agencies are already doing this. So anything that an agency has in their protocols, you know, saying that examiners have to annotate and demonstrate the similarities for IDs they have to follow. But is that for ANAB going to be more of a universal requirement where all agencies are going to have to have this type of documentation for uh, for their IDs? Well, what I would say is that you may actually be referring to two different clauses within one within 17025 and then one within the ANAB accreditation requirements document. So starting with section 4.13.2.1, there's this concept brought forward about something called the audit trail. And and the sentence that I'd like to rely on is the one that is, the records for each test shall contain sufficient information to facilitate, if possible, identification of factors affecting uncertainty. And I'm going to emphasize, to enable the tests to be repeated under conditions as close as possible to the original. So that clause in 17025 has been around since... 2005, since the original publication of that document. So so that would be one clause. And there is another clause that I wanted to rely on, and that was the evaluation of the unknown before taking a look at the known. Was that the one right. that you were you right. were more closely referring to? Well, the, the first kind of one, both. I think we used to satisfy by saying, well, the images are there and the competent quote-unquote examiner would be able to just take those images and recreate the exam. Mm -hmm. I I think some agencies have interpreted it that way, just as long as you have the original images that they were working with. But I think we're seeing in courtroom challenges, which are, you know, obviously different than a quality assurance challenge, that, (laughs) well, without knowing which features the examiner relied upon specifically to reach their conclusion, then we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily say that they did recreate the exam. They might have the same conclusions, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that they can recreate the exam. And I, if I may, I would suggest to you that ANAB would probably not be that literal of the translation of 4.13.2.1. Mm-hmm. So I, I believe your statement that maybe the Court systems might be driving that more, or maybe some of the opposing experts might sure. be might be bringing that as as part of the discussion, rather than the actual accrediting body. So, if, if I may, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of put that out there for consideration. So, the other clause that may be considered in the AR thirty twenty eight. So that's that's the shorthand that I'm going to use referring to the accreditation requirements document that ANAB has published. Um, so, for those of you that may have access to that document, again, the the document number is AR thirty twenty eight. Uh, clause would be section five point four point one point two which states all test methods that involve the comparison of an unknown to a known shall require the evaluation of the unknown item to identify characteristics suitable for comparison and, if applicable, characteristics suitable for statistical rarity calculations prior to the comparison of one or more known items. Um, the intent that is that we try to provide is... You know, are is there enough information in that unknown to actually successfully move forward with a comparison? It's it's more the, you know, as a, as I'm sure you've discussed many many times, the the idea of a confirmation bias. So mm-hmm. so you start with right. your known, you know, you have this point of identification and that point of identification, and then you look for them in the unknown. The intent is. From for this clause, the 5412, the intent is please evaluate the unknown first to verify that there are sufficient characteristics to perform a comparison, uh, sufficient pieces that could allow you to make that individualization, and then use those points to then look at the known. 
I would say nowhere in that clause does it actually say you have to mark your unknown. Okay. okay. That, that is one of our questions is simply documenting in your process that that's what we do. Um, and if so, you know, how, how do you document that it was done first before looking at the known if you don't annotate the image? Is it simply enough to say in a form somewhere, yes, I did this? Or do you, the question being, did you have to annotate the unknown first? And that is demonstration that you followed that procedure. I would hate to get that specific to try and direct somebody who has a tremendous amount of training and experience in their discipline. I'm not going to tell them how to drive their car. They mm -hmm. have obviously been qualified and authorized by their laboratory to drive that car. Um, but the actual specifics of, well, first you have to turn on your windshield wipers and then you turn on your turn signal uh, versus the other way around, I again, would believe that as an accrediting body, we would not get into the weeds. We would go back to the intent of the clause in 4.13.2.1, which is, is there sufficient information in that, in those examination records, in those technical records, to support the conclusion that, that the individual came to during that analysis. Um, I would like to just, just briefly highlight note number two, which is under section 5.4.1.2. This requirement is not focused on the process of assessing an unknown in order to identify evidence that will be subject to further comparison. In these circumstances, it may be appropriate to perform a preliminary characterization of the known sample prior to the assessment of the unknown. So in other words, right. if, if I see, yes, it's a whirl, or no, this person only has loops, you know, then then I can start with my known, kind of getting those general characteristics before going to the unknown. But it's it's really not meant to drive down to that level of detail of yes, you must mark this. It could be sure. done in a narrative format. It it could be, you know, however that particular analyst feels most comfortable collecting information about the unknown before migrating over to the known to say here, these, these are my areas of similarity. Right, so if an analyst, let's say, had a worksheet, and the worksheet said analysis of latent, you know, latent print, mm -hmm. uh, so they check that box that they did that, and, and next to that, they indicate that the print has sufficient features to continue to a comparison phase. Again, they check that, and perhaps even there, they describe, um, you know, level one detail, pattern type, level two detail, um, sufficient or something, maybe even X number of minutia or features, even if they don't annotate them, and, you know, third level detail, yes, no, whatever, that would, in the spirit of that requirement, they would hit that because they have demonstrated through objective evidence that they did this process before looking at the known print, correct? Yes. Um, the only the only area that I'm going to pause on for a moment, and, and I think we unfortunately are all guilty of it, is once you create a form and you make it um, easy to fill out, not that I'm saying <laughs> you should make forms difficult to fill out, but the, the intent is if you're going to create a form that just requires yes, no, yes, no, you know, think about... If, if you're doing a technical review, think about, you know, if you're doing a verification, is there some type of a form that you're being asked to fill out? And then you kind of autopilot it. You know, think, of, right. think about doing a course evaluation and you've got ones on one side and fives on the other side. And you say, OK, the teacher was nice or, or you know, the instructor was helpful. OK, I'm going to give them all fives. And you don't actually read all of the elements of what you're actually evaluating. You're just going to say, hey, I'm just going to mark them all five which is why I adore those surveys that say, hey, you need to check number two for us to verify <laughs> that you're actually reading this form or this evaluation. <laughs> so I, I think it's kind, of, it's kind of fun when they put one of those in. But my, again, my only pause of uh, creating a form is, is that rote filling out of the form rather than the thoughtful consideration of what did I actually do during sure. this process. So that, that would be my pause. 
Yeah, I, I, that, and I think that's fair. I think there's a difference between ticking the box and quality uh, documentation. Right. And uh, I I do prefer annotation of the images, pro, you know, at, at full annotation of the images. But I can also see that there might be instances where if uh, if it's an easier image and there's an abundance of features that it might be pretty burdensome to the examiner to have to mark every single feature ahead of time. So maybe they select a grouping of them or select a representative sample. Uh, to me, that would seem that you should tailor that documentation to the difficulty and complexity of the exam, but like you said, still having quality as opposed to rote autopilot. Let me even step down uh, uh, a step even from the form, um, which I know a lot of labs are, are using something like that, uh, but even down to um, more of an old school method uh, of uh, getting a lift card in uh, from a crime scene, uh, beginning with this analysis of the unknown, and then just basically just selecting the latent print by drawing a uh, an arc over the top of it as the documentation that this latent has enough information to move forward uh, and I'll now bring in the known to look at. Um, it, Anya, is, again, is that uh, meeting you know, the, the spirit of that requirement as well? Or is that, is that, have we gone at that point to too little documentation? Again, looking at the wording of the clause itself, um, I as as the gentleman who attended the training mentioned, right. um, you know there there is a phrase that I use. I call them the magic words. So within the A and A B accreditation program, there's a very specific list of words that require that demand that that uh, emphasize the importance of having something in writing. And, you know, as, as we go through that list and compare it to the wording in Clause 5.4.1.2, there are none of those magic words. So there's nothing specifically driving. It basically okay. says that the laboratory has to have a, a, you know, all test methods that involve a comparison uh, require an evaluation. Evaluation is, is something that the laboratory gets to define on how that, you know, what that looks like, what that process looks right, like right. within their organization. So I would be very cautious about um, suggesting one way is better than another. Um, what I would like to emphasize is it needs to be consistent. So however a laboratory does decide that they want to perform this evaluation and be able to replicate the, the identification process, um, as long as they're consistent, that's that's going to be the key. Got it. Um, well, yeah, I think Glenn and I are very much on the same page as to what we would like to see the community go towards. It doesn't sound like, or it sounds like ANAB is going to be not at not to that level quite yet. What I would what I would suggest to you, one of the biggest pieces that you are going to see in the AR, and and it's it's kind of subtle, so I, I would like to take a moment to to recognize this, sure. is that ANAB is moving away from this is how you need to do something, and focusing much more on this is what you need to do. You need to have a procedure for this. Your procedure right. needs to address the following pieces, and it's moving away from you know, you will monitor testimony this way. What we're going to now say is, is you know, these, these are the pieces you have to have involved in your testimony monitoring process, but the actual mechanics of it, the how you're going to do it, is going to be left completely up to the laboratory management because they know their people, they know the law enforcement agencies that they work with, they know their court systems, and they're going to be better suited to make those how decisions. Now, one of the tools that you guys um, put out was this ANAB crosswalk document as well. Yes. And so the design of this and the purpose was to, uh, well, you, you tell us. What was, what, what, was, what was the thinking behind this? Well, there were several crosswalk documents that were created. So there was one specifically for the 
part of the forensic science community that was accredited to the ASCLAD Lab International Program uh, based on the 2011 supplemental requirements. So that particular guidance document is the GD, GD standing for guidance document, GD 3030. Then there was also a part of the forensic science community that was accredited to the I, I'm going to shorthand it to be a and B legacy program so that that uh, so rather than having supplemental documents, they had a document titled M as in Michael, A as in Andrew, Michael Andrew 3011, so the 3011. So for those laboratories that were accredited under that program, they would have the GD 3031. So yes, the, the intent for those guidance documents were to help folks literally do, as you said, crosswalk from one accreditation program to the merged accreditation program, which is the AR3028. That was the primary purpose to help folks understand, hey, there's lots and lots and lots of similarities, but there are some changes. There are some deletions because there was a recognition that some of the wording, let's say, in the ASCLAB Lab supplemental document was, in fact, a duplication of text already residing in 17025. So right. we recognize there was no need to have that anymore. So that's probably why you're going to see some deletions. Um, but then there were also some anticipatory, if that's a, a good word for you, there were some anticipatory moves and additions in the AR3028 based on what is known to be coming out in the next revision of 17025. And I know we're probably not going to want to have that as part of this conversation, but uh, we can definitely <laughs> speak about that in the future sometime. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we were we were surprised by a few deletions that we saw. Okay. Uh, um, one of the ones was not terribly surprising, but there were a few things in there, and we saw that the supplemental latent print section uh, appendix C was dropped from you know the the ASCLAD Lab supplemental, and you know when we looked at it, we we thought that most of that dealt with. Uh, documentation of the examination that you know you have to have specific records that allow the recreation of the examination that seemed to be covered under other things correct uh, okay but the one that did surprise us the most was the administrative review we didn't see that anywhere and it looked like that had been dropped is that our understanding then? correct administrative review is not located in the AR 3028 and the decision behind that was um, had had multiple sources. Um, first, it was again trying to move away from the this is how we need you to run your laboratory to each laboratory needs to evaluate the risk that is acceptable to it. And again, this is this is kind of foreshadowing or or already preparing for the shift in seventeen zero two five where there is there is a specific section within the 2017 revision, uh, at least the draft, uh, what's known as the Final Draft International Standard 17025. Within that document, there's a section titled Risk. And the, like the, the philosophy behind removing the required administrative review of all test reports was first getting away from telling laboratories how to run their laboratories. Um, again, walking, you know, carefully backing out of the, this is how you should run your lab, and, and focusing more on each laboratory needs to evaluate how much risk is acceptable. If you mm -hmm. think somebody who is a newly minted analyst in latent prints or a newly qualified crime scene person, and you think that their reports need a second viewing by an experienced individual maybe for the first year, then that would be you determining what risk is acceptable. So for you, that person during their first year might still be a little green, might still be cutting their teeth. And having that safeguard, that second pair of eyes come in, allows that newly authorized person to have just a little bit of a comfort level, still a little bit of the training wheels on, even though they have been doing casework independently, they still have that senior person kind of just making sure everything looks nice 
to the point where you take the training wheels off, you take the hands off the back of the bike, and you let that person bike on their own. And you've decided, okay, well, after a year, yes, maybe it's after three months, maybe it's after six months, you know, or maybe this person was so strong in their moot court, the decision is made by the management to let that person go as soon as they're authorized. Sure, you know, sure. some folks are just very, very strong and very confident, and, and you, you kind of sit back and go, wow, that person's amazing, versus another person might be very technically strong, but maybe administratively would probably benefit from, from having somebody just reviewing it a little bit, tweaking it here in, until they truly feel comfortable. Well, one of the, uh, the other things I, I was looking at and talking about last week was now, yeah, please let me let me explain. I had heard this from various examiners until I had a chance to look at the actual requirements. And one of the things that we we had been hearing was that any methods that you use must be reported in the report. So if if I, for example, get an item of evidence in for latent print processing and I'm authorized in that category of testing, and so I do superglue fuming, and I do some dye stain on it, and I do some powdering, that all methods used must be declared in the report. But when we looked at the requirements, we didn't see that in there. Is this a misunderstanding of examiners, or are we missing it, or... Uh, what? Uh, where is this coming from? Where is that conversation coming from? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. and and I think I might have an idea of where folks are are reading this, interpreting this, and and feeling this. So, if you were to look back at the 2011, the Asclad Lab International 2011 Supplemental Requirements in Section 5.10. There were three options given under Section 5.10.1, and in the note, it actually outlines three possible options that the laboratory can avail themselves of when it comes to demonstrating compliance with Sections 5.10.2, and 5.10.3 in 17.025. So more specifically, if you look at 5.10.2, the introductory wording is the test report shall include at least the following information unless the laboratory has a valid reason for not doing so. And item number E, as in Edward, states identification of the method used. Mm-hmm. So, in Got the it. 2011 interpretation, it allowed three options. So, option one, number one, was to include all the information listed under 510.2 and 510.3. Option two was to generate the test report along with an appendix or an annex that would go with the test report that would include all the information required in 510.2 and 510.3. Option number three, which quite a few folks may have availed themselves of, was to ensure that any items not addressed in the test report would be included in the examination records. Mm-hmm. So now, as we migrate from the 2011 supplemental into the AR3028, that option was taken off the table. It is no longer in the AR3028. So my best guess Mm -hmm. is that because that Uh. note is not included, was not carried forward from the Asclad Lab supplemental into the AR3028, that there is now a belief that I have to indicate the method used. Now, what I'm going to do is very cautiously, very carefully. <laughs> um, it, it will still be misunderstood. Don't worry. Of, of course it will. still misunderstand, but I appreciate your, your candor. What I would like to do is, again, in the introduction of the wording in 510.2, it states, unless the laboratory has a valid reason for not doing so. So, A, right. that's, that's one option. If the laboratory says the the customer does not receive any value from me spending a paragraph or a bulleted list explaining every possible processing method that I may have used during the course of the analysis. So, so again, the laboratory may state this is a valid reason for not doing so because it doesn't help the customer. The, the other... Poss- and, and, and I'm, I'm sorry Please. to interrupt, but that would be stated in the QSM then, right? That or sorry, quality systems man, you would expect that in the in somewhere in your quality systems manual, not in the report. That that valid statement you just referred to. Well, again, the the intent behind Section five point ten is this is how you're communicating information to your customer. Right. 
So if the laboratory management evaluates the situation and realizes the law enforcement community does not receive any value from having every method listed in the test report, basically the detective just wants to know if it was John Smith's fingerprints. <laughs> Me telling them every single processing method that I used and, and you know the methodology behind my comparison process they don't care, you know, it's, and, and it's one of those unique things that we within the forensic science community have. We have this very unique relationship with law enforcement where many times um, the, the detectives, the investigators are relying on the forensic laboratory to make the best choices for the investigator. And, and this is a very different position than where 17025 comes from because a very large part of the audience of 17025 is private industry. So the example that you may remember from training is if you envision yourself being at a doctor's office and the doctor needs to draw some blood because they want to check your cholesterol level. The doctor who is the customer for the testing laboratory is directing the testing laboratory. This is the test I need you to run. Whereas in the forensic community, the law enforcement personnel, the investigators rely on the forensic laboratory to select the best and most appropriate method. And however you did it, I'm sure you did it well. And I just need to know if it's John Smith's fingerprint. So it's, it's this kind of um, two, but, but two different o- worlds between a typical customer in the rest of the world versus a customer in the forensic science community. And the fact that 17025 was primarily written with that other customer in mind. So, but am I right then? We would expect then that statement of we don't, we're not putting our methods in the report because they're not useful to the customer. That statement would go in the QSM then, right? Correct. You would, you would be able to state related to item 5.10.2 and 17025 subclause E, our customers do not find value in having that. That, that might be one. Now, I, I, will, I would hope that the laboratory has a constructive discussion <laughs> with their assessment team, with their lead assessor to say, you know, this, based on conversations with our customers, we have found this to be true. So I would say before jumping and adding something like that into your management system, I would say if you had supporting information from your customers, clearly defining that, clearly communicating that to your laboratory management, I think having that information would make that position of, look, our customers don't need this in their test reports. They don't want it. We've talked to them about it. And here's the objective evidence on that. I think then it becomes easily justifiable when you say, unless the laboratory has a valid reason for not doing so. Yeah, we've had a conversation with them. They right. they don't care. And and that looks well. Like maybe it's... they do care, but you know. <laughs> no, they don't. They they really don't. <laughs> um, they want to know if it was John Smith. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I, that that seems to be really you know hammered home in the AR thirty twenty eight five point ten point two uh, note three. Um, which says a, a valid reason, uh, you know, it talks about different valid reasons, one of which being a written agreement with the customer for a simplified report. There you um, go. So that's, that sounds like exactly what you're saying. Now I'm going to to jump on the, the, you know, devil's advocate uh, side here for a second and uh, suggest that, um, that, you know, any potential defense attorney that may uh, be involved in a case is also a, uh, a customer of the crime lab. So then, um, or, or prosecution that or prosecution. Like to have everything revealed <laughs> up front for them. Um, could, you know, could the, could the, uh, the requirement be read in a way that would then require all that information to be not in the case record, but in the actual report every time. Um, so that these, that any potential customer down the road, uh, would also have access to it in the report, even though they may also have access to it in the examination record. What would you say to that argument? Right. Are we narrowing our scope here by limiting 
quote unquote customer to just the police officer who has submitted the evidence or is that actually part of the definition of customer because of the agreement between the customer and the laboratory well i'm i'm going to kind of talk to this on uh, from two different directions um first i'm going to present the the idea of who the customer is and acknowledge that in general there are three different layers of customers. Um, I would suggest that the primary customer of the forensic laboratory is the organization entity individual that comes to the laboratory requesting services. Um, right. To my knowledge, no jury has ever asked a forensic laboratory to do something, nor has a defense attorney. So most times it's going to be law enforcement that that is going to be considered, I'm going to call them the primary customer. Okay. Um, I would absolutely recognize, acknowledge, and say a very important part of the forensic process is this second layer of customers. So we have the justice system the individuals that will be using the test report for the purposes of making decisions. You know, they're going to decide how to counsel their client on, you know, is, you know, look, the, the forensic information that we have is telling us this, this, and this, so maybe we should consider talking to the prosecutor. So again, there's this second layer of customer. This could be the judges, this could be the juries, the prosecutors, the defense, then we also have a third layer of customer, and I don't want to overlook those folks either. The third layer of customer is going to be the public that that laboratory yeah, serves. So I would suggest to you that not only the accreditation process protects all those customers, but I would suggest to you that the, the justice process that we have in the United States also supports all those customers. That's why we have discovery as part of our process. That's why we have court orders. That's why the judges are able to issue those court orders and demand certain things. So I would say as long as everybody is doing their part, so the, the forensic examiner does their part by evaluating the evidence, maintaining sufficient technical records, presenting the information in a clear and coherent manner so that people can read it and understand it, I think they are fulfilling their role. It, it is not the job of the forensic scientist to do the attorney's job for them if they believe there is value in asking, requesting those technical notes. I, I think absolutely that is something that's available to them. So, Oh, Glenn, I wish you could see me right now. The grin on my face is so big. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to just stand up and start a slow clap. Yeah, know, right. That... Uh, well, We've yeah, had this I mean, discussion before of it's not our job to do the lawyer's job. If they want to, to have the notes, they should ask for the notes. Um, and, yeah. and this also compares, you know, we, we have this adversarial process in the United States as opposed to the inquisitor process, which is available right. in some other countries. Good and, point. And, and there's different methodologies. There, there's different philosophies in how we present information in those different types of of court system. So I, is, is anything perfect? No, because we've got human beings involved. So yeah. we, we are, we need to always be open to having that conversation. No, you make a, a, a really great point there. It's so easy for me to um, think of this in terms of, of course, American jurisprudence, but these are international standards and they are applied to laboratories across the world. So yeah, different justice systems would have, of course, different, you know, roles and, 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 um, different process for obtaining that information. I think that that really is a good point that sometimes gets lost in American labs. I want to bring up uh, another question, and I'm not quite sure you know, what section this is in, but I know that, that a lot of labs are, are you know, dealing with this, this specific question, and that is most of the time, I would say most of the time in most labs, uh, if they're comparing a fingerprint or a latent print to a group of people, most latent print examiners are are good enough to basically start with the right person, is one way of putting it, uh, identify that person, and then not compare that latent print to the other uh, suspects in the case. And then also then, you know, not uh, report out a, a conclusion to the other people in the case. In that process, there may have been, you know, some glancing through of different papers uh, of all the knowns to 
make that wise decision to choose the correct person to go with, but um, you know the the examiner's not considering that to be a, a full examination. Uh, do you see any issues with this this mode of operating and reporting out um, the identification and then no other conclusions uh, to a latent print to the other suspects? I believe the evidence itself should drive that thought process. Okay. Um, for example, if the analyst receives the lifts from the scene or if they process the evidence themselves and then begin the comparison process and they get a feeling that it's basically one person's fingerprints, that only one person was involved here, you know, I, I think they're probably on pretty firm ground to be able to say, look, once I was able to correlate this to, to Jane Brown, um, you know, I recognize there there were no other prints that could be compared to. So once I made the identification, it, it would have been a bit of a futile exercise, futile exercise. Whereas, um, you know, if, if somebody's submitting too much evidence, you know, if they basically <laughs> just emptied the entire car into a couple boxes and sent it into the laboratory, you know, I think it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult to justify I stopped after one person. My thought is if the evidence is telling you oh, okay. that there's only one person, then then it could be justified. Now, please note that there is no requirement to report out on every single thing in there because we do recognize sometimes customers are a bit over-enthusiastic in the volume of evidence that they submit. <laughs> um, and, and if the investigator is just trying to des- determine was Jane Brown at the scene... I now have objective evidence that I can share with the investigator saying, yes, I found her fingerprints on this, which demonstrates she was at the scene. You know, how many, how many times would you like for me to verify that? Because if you want me to look at all 27 beer bottles and, you know, all the books and all the checks and everything, I'm going to say yes, 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 yes. So it's, it's, I think also, the thought process needs to include what is it that the investigator is requesting. If they're trying to identify, you know, how many different fingerprints were found in the bank as a result of the bank robbery, I think you need to have a bigger discussion with your customer first saying, right. are you kidding me? Seriously? Do you know how many people go in and out of that bank? You got to you gotta kind of narrow it down for me because for, to ask a forensic laboratory to say, and these 276 people were not identified on the bills that were found in the getaway car, you know, it's it's... There, there needs to be some reason applied here. Right. Well, and, and it sounds, too, that this is part and parcel of this risk portion of the of um, these requirements coming out that you're talking about. Because, I mean, yeah, I mean, there is a risk that if you just report one, an identification to one suspect and don't compare or database the remaining things, you might miss a potential suspect. On the other hand, you get the report out faster, and it's a trade-off between getting information to the client, which might be more useful to get a name to start the investigation, Mm -hmm. as opposed to doing all the comparisons to hundreds of people, resolving all those latent prints, and then getting the report out six months later, which doesn't do anyone any good at that point. Right. If we take a look at the AR 3028 Clause 5.10.1.1, it says the laboratory shall have a policy and procedure for the reporting of test results. The procedure shall, A, identify what will be reported for all items received, including items not tested, items created that were or could be tested, and for all testing performed, either partial and complete. So it's, it's an acknowledgement, even in Section A of 5.10.1.1, that you may just do a partial analysis on the submitted items. You may not analyze some things because, again, once you've identified that Jane Brown's fingerprints were found on at least one of the beer bottles, then the right. investigator has the information that they need. So, again, the, the intent is moving away from the how and focusing on the what. So the what is the lab has to have a procedure and you need to decide at a minimum what's going to be reported for all the items received. 
So in some instances, it might not be, you know, it might be processed, but not evaluated. Right. That's definitely a thing that different labs are are moving towards and other labs are, are still, you know, staying with going through every item, every single, in every single case. Uh, but along those similar lines, when we're talking about the all testing performed partial uh, and complete, there's another little kind of twist here in the latent print world where say you have Jane and John Brown are, are the two suspects in the case. Uh, and there's only one latent print uh, that gets developed on everything that's submitted. Uh, you, so you begin comparison to both of them, uh, and the examiner finds one on Jane's fingers that looks really close, goes through the entire process, and results in an identification to Jane. Does the examiner then have to go back and finish the comparison to John to either exclude or reach an inconclusive decision in that comparison, or because the identification was already complete to Jane, can it can it end there? I would does that say, make sense? Yes, it does. And, and I would say I'm having a very similar conversation with folks in DNA, okay. because once they're able to identify it with certainty to one individual, so, so that kind of leaves the door open for partial, you know, if you have some of the alleles that are similar because it was a brother and a sister, right? Uh, rather than a husband and a wife. So brother and sister may have the possibility of having similar alleles in their DNA profiles, um, assuming biological parentage being the right. same. Right. Um, whereas in fingerprints, as long as I want to say that comparison is strong, um, what I would say is once you start kind of edging into the land of, well, it was a partial print, and could I truly eliminate somebody else from that? Um, I, I think in latent prints, uh, the, the default would be, what is the laboratory's practice? If you make an identification, then you may be able to say no further, no further comparisons were made once an identification was presented. Okay. So then there are some, I mean, think the limited labs where this is coming up. Um, and so it just may benefit those labs to have something written into their policy that says something along the lines of, you know, once an identification to one person is reached, then that latent just isn't compared to further people. Additional examinations are unnecessary. Right. Exactly. And now what I would like to present to you as, as part of the thought process is in previous versions of the proficiency testing requirements from Ascloud Lab International, um, there was actually wording in the clauses that expected the individuals to complete their proficiency tests rather than take, um, oh shoot, what was the exact wording? The, the wording was something to the effect of, you know, rather than follow procedures to, to support expediency or, or uh, you know, basically the, the practice was if you can identify the person with three prints, then you no longer need to do any comparisons. But right. a lot of the proficiencies, them, the proficiency tests themselves had, let's say, you know, six items that you needed to compare. The idea was you had to compare and evaluate all six. You couldn't yeah, say once right. you identified the person, you're done. Right. right. So I, I would say that the practice is out there already. And, and Ask Lad Lab had historically said, but you still have an obligation to complete the entire proficiency test. So it's the right. acknowledgement that that practice is out there. So this you is... have to treat the proficiency test a little differently than you might in casework for the sense of expediency. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. So but the there... expediency element already exists within the community. And, right. and again, each laboratory needs to decide when to incorporate something that, into their management system that reflects that. But, and that means basically going through each latent in the proficiency to identify each latent, but not to then after you identify each latent print to go back through and because most proficiency tests have more than one uh, ex a known uh, person yes. not to identify each latent and then go back through and exclude the other say three people um, for each latent print as well not not to do that part 
Correct. The, the intent was not to say, oh, but you still have to compare it to all these other people. The intent is, look, just because you've identified, right. you know, Jane Green does not allow you to skip the rest of the comparisons. Of the latents, right. Yeah. Yep. All right, we're going to uh, take a break right now. Um, uh, we we got so into things with Anya that it went um, over our, our kind of usual <laughs> limit for an episode, and we have a whole another episode coming next week with even more questions and answers and discussion with her. And we uh, assume so, listeners can only listen to so much quality assurance <laughs> in one episode. <laughs> uh, that's true, too. Uh, Small we need bites. A, we need another factoid to break things up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Glenn, uh, what do you have coming up you want to mention uh, for any people out there? Yeah, I'm teaching the Advanced Ace V course that I, I, I don't get a chance to teach very often, but I've got two of them coming up, my, my next two classes. One will be in Laguna Hills, California, the OC. And that is, uh, yeah, woohoo. <laughs> that is February 26th through March 2nd, so in 2018. And then the second one, uh, a couple months later, in Sanford, Florida, which is about 45 minutes north of Orlando. Uh, that's April 16th through April 20th. And a uh, perfect time to be down in Florida for spring break. Totally. And bring the family. Bring the fam. You stay in class, but bring your family and let them go have fun. Oh, yeah. Send them to Harry Potter land or something. Yep, while you're learning about ASB. And so if, if you're interested in either one of those classes, go to ronsmithandassociates.com and register. We'd love to see it, either one of those. Uh, and Exclusionology is going to be coming up the first week of December in Kansas. Uh, so you can go to rayforensics.com for more information and to register for that class. Uh, so with that, uh, send us any questions or comments or thoughts that you have on the Double Podcast, uh, the situation in uh, Illinois, or any of this uh, stuff that we have uh, with Anya uh, about accreditation. Uh, Glenn at EliteForensicServices.com or Eric at RayForensics.com. Listen to us every week on Stitcher, SoundCloud, or on iTunes. Rate us on any of those apps or whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Uh, also, check us out over on Patreon, Double Loop Podcast Patreon. Do a search for that. If you uh, have any extra funds, you can donate to the cause of keeping us uh, going and all these files uploaded onto the internet. Uh, please consider doing that and also the opinions expressed on this episode are those of myself of glenn of anya and not of any other lab or agency or organization so uh, thank you guys for all for listening we'll talk to you guys later bye everybody have a good week